Amen. Well, how are you doing this morning, Oceanside? Good. Doing good? Okay, we'll try and improve that by the, by the end of it. Can you say, tell me again? No, don't worry about it. If we haven't met before, my name is Andy. I have the privilege of uh, leading our eldership team, and that is the team that, that leads the church, and we lead it together. It's an amazing privilege, amazing privilege to have, yeah, Paul and Katie off in Edmonton with some previous elders of Oceanside Church that have established something amazing out there as well. A kingdom is on the move. The kingdom is advancing. Amen? Amen. Amen. I think that's one of the most exciting things about, you know, being on a, a leadership team as a church is you just get to connect with all sorts of amazing stories of, of what God is doing uh, in the community. Of course, there's hard stuff as well. Um, but it's amazing to, to see people coming to Christ for the very first time. People, you know, just dropping in at church, just turning around their cars, coming in, asking for a Bible because God is doing something in their hearts. Even this week at Oceanside, we've just seen people who have no church background just say, hey, I want to find out about God. And it's not because someone has knocked on their door or because a colleague at work has invited them. It's a growing dissatisfaction from what the world offers and people asking questions to say, hey, what, does, what is God offering? And how about that church over there? Okay, what, what do you guys believe? What, what do you say? And man, I got to say, we are, we are seeing people coming to Christ in this season. Amen? It's an amazing here to, you know, there's a church in Victoria, Easter Sunday, had 100 baptisms. Us as well, we've had great baptism service, you know, 20 odd something, you know, high teens the other week. And it's, these aren't long spaces apart. And it's just exciting to be in a, in a city where I believe that God is doing something. And it's in that, it's in that heart and in that vein um, that for the last three weeks, if you've been paying attention, that we've actually switched into a new series here at Oceanside Church, uh, which is a series based on the book of Acts. If you, if you don't know your Bible or if you don't know what the book of Acts is, the book of Acts is basically after Jesus, you know, you've got the four Gospels at the start of the New Testament. They tell the story about Jesus, everything he said and did, his death and resurrection. And then the book of Acts takes us into the aftermath of all of that. And the next 30 odd years of what happened throughout the first century and what through, happened throughout the nations of the world. And uh, in week one, so two weeks ago, I kicked us off just talking about the Great Commission. You know, the, one of the, the, some of the last words that Jesus said to his disciples, he was telling them exactly the purpose. And if you don't know what the Great Commission, it's go into all the nations, make disciples, baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teach them to observe all that I have commanded. Teach them to observe all that Jesus has said, done, and commanded. And it's amazing to think, I don't know how many thousands of kilometers we are away from Jerusalem. Does anybody know off the top of their heads? No, I don't know. Probably some thousand kilometers away from Jerusalem. When, when Jesus was talking about the ends of the earth, he was talking about Nanaimo. And we're here. The gospel is here. Amen. This church is a part of the great, uh, the, the great commission, the 80 or so generations that have come and gone since Jesus spoke those words. This church, this people, us Gentiles that we are, non-Jewish people, most of us, we are the fruits of that great commission. And it, it's exciting. And then week one, we also pointed to, you know, bring us to remember that this is a gospel of repentance. This is a gospel where we have a repentant church who've come before God. You know, we've repented of our sin and we ask other people to repent and then to meet the living God. And then we also said before we can, you know, go out on this great commission is that we need to start with an affection for Jesus. The disciples had just spent three years with Jesus. He had just died. He had rose again. None of them wanted him to leave, but he did. And they had an amazing affection for his, for his call, for his mission. And then last week with the Freedom Session testimonies, so cool to hear those testimonies and even more testimonies over the road at the graduation after the service. But Lee, something you, you said last week that really impacted me was your experience in Walmart where you began to see people like Jesus saw people. Seeing people like Jesus. Hey, Zion. Zion. Quiet, please. Sorry. <laughs> I can hear my lovely son talking. I love his voice, but I'm listening to what he's saying, not what I'm trying to say. But I love that part where, Lee, you said, you know, seeing people like Jesus saw people. I think we can all think about those moments where you're overcome 
with the Father's heart for the city. You know, there was no explosion. I don't think people were laying down, slain in the spirit after Lee had seen that. But, but I think what was happening to Lee is God was revealing to Lee the need, the desperation, the need for the gospel in just a store like Walmart where everybody's going around their business. You know, it's amazing to, to think about, you know, what Jesus said when he walked the earth. He said, you know, I only do what I see the Father doing. And then Jesus introduces you know, the Holy Spirit, which he sends to us after he ascends. And he says, the Holy Spirit is, it doesn't come on his own authority, but he's going to teach you everything that, that I've, he's going to bring you to a remembrance of all the things that I've taught. He's going to lead you into truth. He's not going to come under his own authority. He's going to look to the authority of Jesus, the authority of the Father. Jesus looks to the Father. The Holy Spirit testifies about Jesus. And us, we testify about God. We testify about all of that. It's not about what we want to do. It's about, hey, who is, who is the one who has commissioned me? Who is the one who is sending me? And what do they want to do? Jesus modeled that perfectly in his relationship with the Father. And now we model that to him. And I think what was happening to Lee at Walmart was to say, God was just saying, hey, let me show you what I see in Walmart. Let me show you how I am looking at these people. I see the names of these people, I see the needs of these people, and I'm seeing the calling of these people, and I'm seeing a church that needs to get on the move and get captivated with seeing people like Jesus sees people. Amen? Jesus came, he saw with the eyes of the Father everything that he did, we as well come in that light. So amazing couple of weeks as we just reflect on the beginning here. Just Recapping as well, in Luke 24, one of the final uh, interactions between Jesus and his disciples, Luke 24, verse 46, Jesus is explaining to them everything that had happened. He says, thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the, and on the third day rise from the dead and that the repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are the witnesses of these things. And behold, I am sending the promise of the Father upon you. But stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. The first thing the disciples were told after the Great Commission, after Jesus was saying, you know, you are going to go into all nations, that even Nanaimo is going to hear about the gospel someday, is that he told them to wait. He told them to stay. You think that after Jesus says something, you know, it's like, get right to it. Even the angels, after he ascended into heaven, told the disciples, why do you stand looking into the sky? There was something else that they were supposed to be doing. And indeed, if you've been around church, you know that Jesus was talking about the coming of the Holy Spirit, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the, 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 you know, the tongues of fire, the wind of the Spirit coming upon the disciples in Acts chapter 2. And that's what we want to talk about here today. Now, in the last 12 months, I have talked about baptism of the Holy Spirit on two separate occasions. And so we're going to look at a different angle here this morning about the baptism of the Holy Spirit and why the Holy Spirit came. If you want to look back, though, and if you want to go back to say, hey, I want to discover more about what this coming of the Holy Spirit is and what it means to me as an individual, today we're going to ask what it means to the church. But you can go back to March 12th, where it talks about walking in in the power and authority like Jesus. I wrote an article to go with that as well that just walks you through how Jesus walked with the Holy Spirit and then how he asked us to walk with the Holy Spirit. He modeled our walk on the Holy Spirit upon his. And then on October 29th, we said, what is the baptism of the Holy Spirit? And we did another message on the Holy Spirit. So you got March 12th, October 29th. You can go look back, look at those, watch them. And then we have an amazing Bible school series as well um, that was uh, uh, led by Mark Manfredi a number of years ago. So if you go on our website and you click on school, you can actually look at a number of courses and a few of those pertain to the Holy Spirit. And particularly there's one called Getting to Know the Holy Spirit, where if you're a new believer, if you have questions about, man, what is the Spirit and what is its impact on my life as an individual, that's for you, okay? 
So do you like coming to church and getting homework? Feels like you're just back at school? Perfect. It's okay. But the Holy Spirit is amazing. Jesus said, it's better that I go. None of his disciples, I bet none of them agreed with him on that one. I bet actually that most of us actually don't agree with Jesus on that one either. Actually, Jesus, it would have been better if you stayed. Actually, Jesus says, it's better that I go. And if we're still believing, if we're still clinging in our subconscious to the fact that actually I wish Jesus had stayed and I wish he was standing next to me as my personal buddy, then actually we are missing what comes through the Holy Spirit. And it's my proposition to us here this morning that actually when we become fully awake to the ministry and the effectiveness and the power that is available through the Holy Spirit, that we would fully agree with Jesus. That actually this is the way, this is the proper way, this is how we are going to disciple the nations through the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. Again, even myself, I find myself disagreeing with Jesus. Oh man, I would just like to have coffee a couple of times with you, Jesus. I would just like to go fishing with you and have you, you talk over me. So, a few little things on the Holy Spirit before we begin to catch us up. The first thing to know is that we all, when we come to Christ, receive the Holy Spirit. It says in Scripture that none can say that Christ is Lord except by the Spirit. And Ephesians 1, telling about conversion, Paul writes, and you were also... And you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel for your salvation. And then he says, when you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit. So if you're a believer here this morning, this morning, the thing that we should all agree with is that we are all sealed with that promise of the Holy Spirit. There is no, no part of any one of us that can come to Christ without the Holy Spirit being given to us. Amen? Amen. You all have the Holy Spirit. You are all marked with that seal, the promised Holy Spirit. And you're correct in saying that. And even Jesus, in his disciples with his disciples after the resurrection, how many days were there that Jesus was appearing to the disciples? It was 40 days. Over a period of 40 days, that's over a month, Jesus was appearing to his disciples at different times. And on the very first day of his resurrection, in John chapter 20, verse 21, he says this. It says, Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them. Everybody breathe. <sighs> That's a weird noise. Don't do that. You're giving everybody your disease now. But when he had said this, he breathed on them. <sighs> and he said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. Oh, I can't imagine what it would be like to, you know, I don't know how Jesus did that. Did he, <sighs> Did he, did it, was it one by one? I don't know. It's fascinating. But he breathed the breath of the Son of God, the resurrected Son of God, breathed upon the disciples, and they received the Holy Spirit. That is what Paul was talking about in Ephesians 1. They were marked with the Holy Spirit, the seal of the promise of the Holy Spirit. I believe that that resurrection day, that first day of the resurrection, when Jesus did that with his disciples, that was the first day that those disciples were Christians, because they didn't even, they didn't just believe that Jesus was the Messiah, like Peter said before the crucifixion, you are the Messiah, you are the Christ, but they had now believed in his death, his burial, and now his resurrection. And it wasn't just Jesus, you're going to save us. It was Jesus, you have saved us. You have conquered sin and death. Holy Spirit came and marked upon them with that seal. Do you understand it? Day one, they received the Holy Spirit. We're imagining that breath of Jesus. But then 40 days later, that's over a month later, Jesus says something else. And as we turn, as we're in a series on Acts, we should read Acts, but Acts chapter 1 40 days later in verse 8, this is, we know it's 40 days later because this is the day that Jesus left the disciples. He says, but you will receive power. You will receive power. Okay, they've received the Holy Spirit, but you will receive power. Okay, 40 days later, when the Holy Spirit 
has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Are you catching up with what Jesus is saying here? He breathed on them. They received the mark of the Holy Spirit. And then he said, wait, some days from now, you are going to receive the power of the Holy Spirit. And this is where we start to get our belief and our theology about what it means for the baptism of the Holy Spirit in a believer's life. And I know in a room like this, because Oceanside is only 25 years old, that most of us have not grown up at this church. Most of us come from a different view of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And actually, I'm going to say, I don't really want to fight about what you do and don't believe about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I just basically want to point to the work of the Holy Spirit and say, man, don't we want more of that here this morning? But you should see something happening in Scripture. Day one, receive. Day 40, pointing to the power that is going to come. And on... Sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. Something more is coming to the disciples. And Jesus in verse 5 tells us, and this is why at Oceanside we call this the baptism of the Holy Spirit, because Jesus says, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So why does Oceanside believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit? Because Jesus believes on the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I like believing the things that Jesus believes in. Amen? And he says, not many days from now. So day 40, he said these things. Ten days later, we're going to see the Holy Spirit and how it comes. Now, one thing that I think really trips us up on this is actually The word baptism itself. Is the word baptism uh, an English word? I guess it is because it's been around long enough that I guess you would find it in an English dictionary. But actually, the word baptism is a direct like transliteration from the Greek word baptizio, okay? And what we did as Christians is we said, hey, that this word baptism... Or this Greek word is so important to the roots and the foundation of our theology is that we are actually going to bring it directly into our English language. And even though the English language doesn't have a word or a, really a need for a word like baptism, we're going to bring it over so we can have this really deep, rich, theological word that explains all of this amazing stuff with just one word because we're bringing it right out of the text of the Bible. Make sense? So, so baptism for us, it, it carries, you know, if you asked, you know, what religion does the word baptism belong to? If you ask someone out on the street, what would they say? Well, that belongs to Christianity. You would never use the word baptism outside of a Christian setting. There's, there's, there's no reason to do that, apart from maybe a popular or common phrase that you hear thrown around. So the word baptize, it it comes directly from the Bible, and we brought it along because we really love it, and it carries all this rich theological meaning about water baptism, about this single time, this momentary decision that we make that represents our death, our burial, our resurrection in Jesus Christ. It represents repentance. It represents washing. It represents being made new, and you only need to do it once because once you're saved, you are saved. Amen? Amen. That's what baptism means. But the thing that trips us up is is we take that word baptism and all the meaning of that baptism of repentance and the, the singleness, the momentariness of it, and we say, oh, we use the same word for baptism of the Holy Spirit, so I'm gonna apply all that same theology of water baptism to Holy Spirit baptism. Don't we? And that's why we disagree so much about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Because you will say, well, if you believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit, then you think it's just a one-time thing. You think it's a separate thing from salvation. But don't all Christians have the Spirit? And we will say, yes, we believe all Christians have the Spirit. But Jesus, you know, said there was something more coming. There was power coming. All of this stuff. And we get into all of this theological debate because we're using this this word that we brought across directly from the Greek that carries all this weight and beautiful theology. But it trips us up. 
And I want to say for us here this morning, what I want to teach here this morning is that actually I want to say that maybe for us as we, we journey on this, if you're having a hard time figuring out the baptism of the Holy Spirit, then, then an equal meaning of baptism is immersion. To Jesus, in Jesus' day, when he said baptized, it didn't carry the theological weight that it carries to us. Do you understand? Because he was using a regular word. He was basically saying, John immersed in water, but I'm going to immerse you in the Holy Spirit. And I think for the purposes of understanding the Holy Spirit and our relationship with the Holy, Holy Spirit, I'm not chucking away the word baptism or anything like that. It's a very useful word. But if, if we're feeling tripped up, if we're feeling like we can't connect the dots, again, just, just, just look at another meaning, the, the common sense meaning of if we hadn't brought the word over to the English language, if we just attempted to translate it instead of bring it over completely, we would have said, John immersed in water but you will be immersed in the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Is that beginning to make sense? Now we know what we are only immersed once for repentance. Jesus transforms us once. But in the Holy Spirit, we see throughout the book of Acts that the disciples were filled. They were filled. They were filled. They were filled again. None of you goes and has a shower and thinks, oh, I'm done forever. Some of you teenagers think that. And I thought that as a teenager, there's that, there's that awkward stage in life where you're needing to shower through puberty. And uh, yes, thanks for putting us up with, with up, up with us young lads. John immersed with water, but you will be immersed with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. And the amazing thing is, is that when we see this happening all throughout the book of Acts, we see the writer, the Luke, the, the historian, the doctor, noting down all of these stuff, and he uses tons of different words to describe the coming of the Holy Spirit. Jesus says, you will be immersed in the Holy Spirit. But when the immersion comes, Luke recounts it saying they were all filled with the Spirit. So Jesus said, you will be immersed. When he recounts the story, they were filled with the Spirit. And that's the most common phrase in the Acts. We also see that when, when the disciples go, the Holy Spirit fell on people. So we didn't have this watery connotation. It was just, you know, well, maybe water from the sky, maybe. Okay, still there. But um, it fell. Also says received. I believe it was the Apostle Paul when, when he received the Holy Spirit. Well, that was his, back, you know, all of this stuff. We see all these different words. And, and Jesus actually, you know, in, in Luke, when he's talking about that baptism, he's saying, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. So even Jesus uses different words to describe what's going to happen at Pentecost and what is going to happen all throughout Acts. Yeah. Why am I saying this? It's because I don't want you to get tripped up. I, I think sometimes we, we, we get tripped up, we get stuck, and we, and we don't go any further. You know, it's like walking through a maze, and there's this delicious thing at the other end of the maze, and you, you reach a dead end, and, and you just give up. No, no. See the richness. See the life. See what God wants you to have. Don't get so caught, caught up on one word. It, it just see what that word was trying to describe. Man, you are going to be dunked in the Holy Spirit. We see also in Acts that it doesn't always happen right away at conversion. Sometimes the Holy Spirit just falls, and then the disciples are like, we better baptize these people because the Holy Spirit is here. And sometimes people, a, a, a town agrees to follow Jesus, and then they send away for the apostles, and then the apostle comes probably days, days, maybe even weeks later because of the journey, and then the Holy Spirit comes. So we believe that in this dual sense that we're all marked by the Holy Spirit. We can't cry out to Jesus without it. But there's this differential, there's this, there's this change. And Ephesians 5, we know it, says, Do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. The writer doesn't say, look back to the seal of the Spirit on your life. Don't get drunk with wine, but look back to the seal of the Spirit. No, but be filled. Do it again and again and again. 
And our challenge for us as a church here this morning, as we, as we live in an unchurched nation, in an unchurched city, a city that needs the gospel, we have to ask ourselves, are we a church that is being filled with the Spirit? For me, I feel like the answer is no. <laughs> the Spirit's here. But we need to push in with a great hunger for what God wants to do. And it's not about the Spirit for the Spirit's sake. It's about the Spirit for what the Spirit tells us He's going to do. And what we want is the, what the Spirit is going to do amongst this nation, amongst this city. Mark Manfredi, he says this a bunch of times when he's, when he's teaching about the Holy Spirit. He says, the, the right question is not how much of me does, not much of, the right question is not how much of the Holy Spirit do I have, but how much of me does the Holy Spirit have? And when I was talking about the baptism of the Holy Spirit some months ago, I, I said this, the devil wins when he makes Christians too afraid to pick up the power that is available to them through the Holy Spirit. If we allow ourselves to be tripped up and go no further because we bumped our knee and we're not going to get up again and try that again, the devil wins. Jesus doesn't win. The enemy who doesn't want us to go further into the things. And 1 Thessalonians 5 says, do not quench the Spirit. A direct command for us, do not quench the Spirit. Am I quenching the Spirit in Oceanside? Are we quenching the Spirit in our lives, our understanding? Do not despise prophecies, but test everything and hold fast to what is good. So let's look. Pentecost. Acts chapter 2. If you have your Bible, open it to Acts chapter 2. And we're just going to go verse by verse if uh, media team, if you could just hang the verses on the screen and we're just going to go slowly through this. Acts chapter 2, verse 1. It says, When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. The disciples did not know when the Holy Spirit was going to come. Just the fact that Jesus had told them to wait. And 10 days earlier, then this day of Pentecost, he had physically left them at that point. So 10 days, they are just waiting. It doesn't tell us anything else about what they're doing in that place. We presume they're praying, they're interceding. You know, these are good disciples. They know what to do. You know, they're probably praising other things like that. But at that very moment, we don't know if they're eating a meal. We don't know, you know, what is going on. Other than it's early in the morning, about 9 a.m., and they were all together in one place. First of all, the, the imagery that comes to mind is just that peace is they were all together. You know, so many times that when we talk about the coming of the Holy Spirit, we think it, you know, we think about it on that individual level. Do I have the baptism of the Spirit? Have I been filled with the Spirit recently? You know, and we get so concerned because, you know, me as an individual before God, you know, do I have it? Do I don't have it? Do I have enough of it? Do I need more of it? But in this case, in this time, it was about being together. When they were all together, we need to receive the Holy Spirit together. This nation will be changed when we receive the Spirit together, okay? We need to be hungry together. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they didn't choose the location. They didn't choose the time. That was preordained. That was de delivered to them by Jesus Christ on his decision, and they were all together in one place. Then verse 2 says, And then suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Now it's the time where I ask you to make it sound like a mighty rushing wind, but I, I can't. Maybe I can do it. <sighs> no, it doesn't work. But can you imagine the sound? Mighty rushing wind. What is the most powerful wind that you've ever heard? Maybe you've been out in a gale and storms and been pelted by the rain and the snow. When, when, when the wind of God comes, I'm betting it, it is a loud experience. And I don't think that this is a surprise that God did this. 50 days ago, Jesus breathes on them. But now he is blowing his hurricane over them. The wind in the Old Testament, it's synonymous with the Spirit of God, the breath of God. 
For those disciples, when they heard a sound like a rushing wind, they would have looked back to the Old Testament and was like, man, God is breathing here. This is the ruah, this is the wind, this is the breath, this is the very thing that God is doing. Genesis 1, it says that the Spirit of God, the ruah of God, the breath of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And now the ruah, the breath, was coming back to the, early, to the first church, and he came in like a mighty rushing wind. Ezekiel 37, we see the ruah of God turn up again when God breathes into the dry bones. God breathes into the dry bones, and what happens? Life comes, transformation comes. When the wind of God blows, something happens. When the wind of God blows in Genesis 1, creation happened. When the wind came to the dry bones, they came to life. When the wind came to the Red Sea, it was parted in two and God's people crossed. The ruah of God came and blew and blew and blew and God sent his people on his mission. And now we see at Pentecost, the ruah, although it's a different language, the breath, the wind is coming again. A sound like a mighty rushing wind filled the entire house where they were sitting. The breath of God, I believe. Verse three, and divided tongues as of fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. Think as well, why fire? Why, what were you doing? We see fire when, when God first spoke to Moses through the burning bush. The bush was on fire, but it wasn't being consumed. And that re represented, you know, the holiness of God. Moses, don't come any closer. Take off your sandals. God's here. God's doing something. We think about the pillar of fire that led the Israelites through the desert at night, representing God's deliverance, his leadership, his protection, his provision, his, his, he is with them. And when God descends upon Mount Sinai, the mountain is covered with smoke and fire, the awe-inspiring nature of God being revealed. And here he is revealing himself again at Pentecost in a new season. Then he delivered the law, but now he is delivering the Spirit in power, church. Like a wind, like breath of God, like fire. Verse four, and they were all filled. They were all filled. There wasn't some one you know, in the kitchen that wasn't filled. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And what we remember here is that Jesus said, you know, go into all nations, proclaim. And isn't it amazing when the Spirit came upon them, it was the Spirit who gave them the proclamation. It was the Spirit who gave them the utterance. When you think that you don't have it within you, when you think that it's like, how could I be someone to declare the gospel to the world around me? Guess what? Be filled with the Spirit and I'm sure God will do it. Because even for the apostles, it didn't come from them. Jesus didn't say, use your three years of really good training. Here, I'll give you a certificate. Yep, you can show your certificate to people and you'll be good. You can go preach and all this other stuff. No, he gave them the baptism of the Holy Spirit and they were filled and then he gave them the utterance that they needed to disciple the nations. And it's in this part we see where if we want to disciple this city, if we want to disciple our families, if we want to disciple our workplace, if we want to see this place change, we need to be filled so we can have the utterance of God. Because in our own training, in our own abilities, Jesus didn't leave the apostles, the disciples to their own abilities. He gave them power. He gave them breath. He gave them fire. And in the aftermath of all of this, Pentecost is amazing because there's people visiting from all these different nations. And the reason why we believe God did it then is because he just, man, God wanted to spread the word quickly to people. In verse 11, talking about all these people who have come from all over to, to join with the Pentecost feast, it says in verse 11, we hear them telling in our own tongues, our own languages, the mighty works of God. 
And all were amazed and perplexed. You can be amazed and perplexed all at the same time. Did you know that? Saying to another, one another, what does this mean? Even when the Spirit comes, even if you are perplexed, does not mean it is not of God. Does it need to be biblical? Yes, absolutely. Can you be perplexed? Yes, absolutely. And actually, one of my favorite things about the Holy Spirit is if you try to get out your chalkboard and you try to figure out the, you know, the algebra of how to get the Holy Spirit to come, how to get a healing to come, all this other stuff. Well, just do this, bend over here, read this verse, say this thing three times, and then you'll be baptized in the Holy Spirit. That's not going to work. The Spirit isn't a dog that you invite in to run around and call over and hopefully it obeys you. Not at all. We go with the command of the Spirit, listen to the Spirit's utterance, and we obey the Spirit. Spirit doesn't obey us. Even if we are perplexed. Verse 13, but others mockingly said, they are filled with new wine. They were calling them drunk. And then Peter gets up and he preaches the gospel to this crowd. 3,000 people get saved. And he points back to the book of Joel in the Old Testament where he points to this prophecy and says, it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams and your young men shall see visions. Even on the male and female servants, even on the servants in those days, I will pour out my spirit. Peter was saying, the pouring the immersion, the filling, not just the seal, that is now here and it's in spades. Church, the reason why we have turned to the book of Acts as our, our text for the next you know, 10 or 12 weeks, however long God keeps us in this text, is because, man, we have just felt as an eldership team is that we need to steer all that we are doing to be more mission-focused than we've ever been before. You know, I've heard about days in Oceanside Church, you know, when we were in the Roxy Theater, dubbed by some as the glory days. You know, the Spirit came in power. There was, there was all this stuff, and churches go through different seasons. Churches go through different seasons, but I believe the season that Jesus by the power of this Holy Spirit is taking us into is an explicitly missional season, church. And I am not a missional person. I'm an introvert. So I'll do this and you do the mission, okay? (laughs) I've got an agreement with the Lord here. He's told me it's okay. I teach you, you're fine. (laughs) But we laugh and even I myself make excuses left, right, and center about Man, I'm, I just do my job, all this other stuff. Oh, Lord, I stick my AirPods in and get nice and isolated as I walk around Costco, all that stuff. Close my eyes, don't look at anyone like Lee does. That'll freak them out. But we believe that God is calling us to be missional church. And I just feel something. Again, I don't know what it is, but I just feel something within this city that God is wanting to make a change. He is wanting to change the course of this city completely. And I don't know now if it's just because, you know, I get to, you know, take that point on the leadership team that now I'm hearing about all these different conversion stories. You know, maybe Mike heard of, about all of those, the same as what I'm hearing about. But I tell you, something tangibly is different happening here. Yeah. Where we're hearing about, you know, those mother's groups on Facebook where kids are just asking their parents, can I go to church? Can I learn about God? These kids have not grown up in in Christian households. I have no idea how they've heard about God and Jesus, but they are asking their parents, can we go to church? And they are asking random groups on Facebook, hey, are there any good churches around? Because my kids want to go. And then this week, having people just turn up at the church and say, can you tell me more about God? Can, can I buy a Bible here? It's like, no, we can, we can give you a Bible here. We can explain the gospel to you. People, families, entire families coming. God is doing something new. God is doing something new. If we've chucked in the hat to say, this society, this nation, it's, it's just going down the drain, I tell you, it is not true. 
Every great awakening that has ever happened, happened at a time where it was greatly needed. And we believe that we are in a city that greatly needs the move of God again. We are not in the business of throwing away Nanaimo. We are not in the business of looking at the hardships about the statistics like, yeah, we're the least church city in the whole of Canada. No, I believe God wants to display his glory again in this city. And it's not about just praying for the Spirit and getting filled with the Spirit and getting the jollies and the joy of the Holy Spirit. No, it's about the mission that the Holy Spirit comes for, to glorify Christ, to grow the kingdom, to heal, to prophesy. It's not about us. It's about his kingdom. And church, we need to do this together. Today is not a a, a talk to say, come up and get your individual fix of the Holy Spirit. And if you need prayer, we'll be happy to pray for you. If if God is working on you and you feel the Holy Spirit's prompting to say, you need to go to the front, you need to be prayed for the Holy Spirit, we will do that absolutely. But today is about being together in the Holy Spirit. When the disciples were all together, the first Tuesday of every month, What we're doing at the moment is we're opening our our building across the road just to have a completely unrehearsed, undirected time with God. Basically, what happens is someone picks up an acoustic guitar and we worship. Seven o'clock, first Tuesday of every month, we worship. And then when the worship runs dry, we raise our voices in intercession for the city, for what God is doing. Church, I know it's only once a month at this time. But I want to invite you is that we need to grow as a church who are hungry, who are praying, who are interceding over a city that desperately needs the move of God. So I want to invite you out on May 7th. That is the next one. On May 7th, 7 p.m., come along. We are going to intercede for the city. We've called it a worship night. It's a that's a pants kind of title. It's, it's not just about worship because worship so often we construe to being about us. No, it's about glorifying God, getting our eyes on him and then lifting up the church and lifting up the city. Yeah. First Tuesday of the month, come. If we want to see a city changed, we need to be together in prayer. And I want to do this. I want to say as well for this next one, I've just been talking to some people and they're, man, we need to cultivate a great hunger for the mission of God. Because even I myself, you know, I'm saying these things, but do I really want it? Honestly, what I really want is a Coke and I want to sit out in the sun after the service and think, ah, right? That's what I really want. But what the Spirit within me, what the Holy Spirit wants is to see the church overflowing and crazy and filled. Okay, that's what we want. And on these, on these evenings, in our prayer, as we come, as we intercede, we feel our hearts changing, our hearts shifting, our appetite growing for the glory of God in our nation, a dissatisfaction with what, with what has happened or what we've been going after in the natural, and a satisfaction in the hunger that we are pursuing in Christ. And May 7th, I, I want to ask our church, if you're coming to that meeting, I want to ask you if it's possible if you can fast and pray before that meeting. You know, I confess the last one that I came to in April, you know, it was Lots of stuff going on, and I was like, oh, we got prayer and worship tonight, and I'm rooting through my Bible, looking for some scriptures, looking at all this thing. This is my wrong attitude to come to pray before the Lord. It needs to be an overflow of what is already happening. And what we want is to build a church where it's a people who are overflowing with the heart for the city, a heart to see the kingdom come. And then occasionally we come together and we plead before the Lord together, And I believe God is calling us together. So from Sunday, May 5th to Tuesday, May 7th, if you want to, fast along with me and we'll break bread together after that. We also have Thursday mornings. Every Thursday morning, you might not know this, but we intercede for you, our congregation, at the office. 
eight, about 8.40 in the morning to 9.40. We pray for an hour as a staff and anybody else is welcome to join us. This Thursday was amazing as we're praying for all these names and people who are coming into the church who we know by name. And we're praying for the city. We're praying for the other churches. We're praying that God would captivate us. We're not praying that God would you know, fill our bank accounts or do this thing to make life easier. No, we're praying that his kingdom would come. And church, I tell you that Nanaimo needs a church that is on its knees praying for it. We need to be praying. We need to be going to God. We need to be all together. We need to be a together church in this. And as we close, I wanna point us to the fact and the reason for the mission that Jesus came What is the purpose of Pentecost? What is the purpose of Pentecost? You might say it was about power. Some of you in your experience with some churches, you've seen it as a superiority thing. But actually, you know, people who had the spirit and they have this high gifting and all that, those are the people who just feel that they're superior than the other ones. No, the the purpose of the Holy Spirit coming, the purpose of that baptism, the purpose of that immersion was because 3,000 people were saved that day. And then a few days later, 5,000 people were saved. And then cities and nations and then the Nimos were saved in his name. When we are asking for more of the Spirit, when we are asking You know, it's a problem in the church when the method becomes the goal or the, it's not the right word, have grace. You know, you find these people who, collectors, insane collectors. I, I bought this amazing Bible recently. I, I, my graceful wife, every so often I say, honey, I need a new Bible. This one's leather is not good enough. And it's, its font is not good enough. And the weight of the paper is not good enough. And I, and I found this person to buy this Bible secondhand. You can vent, my wife can vent to you later. But we can collect this beautiful thing that is the word of God and all this other stuff. But in that, like, am I desiring the word or am I desiring a, a product that the word comes on? And these other people, I bought it from a lady where she was like selling like 500 different types. She collected all this stuff. And I'm like, I guess she loves Jesus. I'm not judging her heart and all this other stuff. And I'm like, that's a lot of Bibles. It's like, oh yeah, but the smell. (laughs) So good. It doesn't smell like Jesus. It smells like cool glue and other stuff. I don't know. But we need to go after the thing. The thing that's value about this book is not the paper, the the leather, or the awesome stuff. It's about the word on the page. It's about the life-giving spirit that, that comes when we read and we agree with the word that is here. And where we've sometimes confused and where we've sometimes stayed in that tripped-up state is we've, we've, we've seen the spirit you know, become the focal point, become the desired thing. And it's not a bad thing in itself. But when it becomes the only thing, we need to, we need to remember that the spirit came to point to Jesus. We need to remember that the Spirit came to point to mission and to fulfill the mission. We need to remember, and yeah, the Holy Spirit comes to heal. If you need healing, Holy Spirit's about it. It came to prophesy. Think about all the spiritual gifts that are listed in the New Testament. The, the, the Holy Spirit's got these amazing gifts, but it, it, it's to do something. It's, it's for the body, and it's for the glory of Jesus. It's to build us up. And sometimes where you, if you've been caught on the other side where you've actually seen a negative view of the Holy Spirit, it's because you've thought what is happening is just, man, they, they, they just want the Spirit so they can fool around looking like drunkards and all this other stuff. And there's going to be a measure of your heart that is right, and there's going to be a measure of your heart that is wrong because you don't know what's happening in the other person's life, okay? But for us right now, the reason why we desire more of the Holy Spirit is not for the Spirit's sake, it's for the nation's sake. It's for bringing people into the kingdom. It's for expanding the kingdom. We believe that when the Spirit comes, the mission increases and the church grows. And that is not for the glory of the church. It is for the glory of only one, Christ Jesus. That has to be it. 
I want to steal a scripture from Lee's message last week. I don't actually think you got to it because your time was short. But turn to Acts 4.29. We're going to read this as we close. And Camilla, perhaps you can come up with Taryn and lead us in prayer as we end. Acts 4.29. And I want to say everything, everything, everything that we need to do in the next season as Oceanside Church is we need to think more missionally about what we're doing. How is my connect group achieving the mission of God? Is there space for a, a new person, someone who has just picked up that Bible this week to come into my connect group? How could I split my connect group? So instead of having one connect group, we could have two. Because I tell you, a, a church that isn't ready to receive is a church that won't receive. God wants to bring the nations into a church that is ready, that is hungry, that is ready for some holy chaos, amen? We need to become a missional church in everything we do. Verse 29. Grant your servants, Lord, grant your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness. First thing we see, grant your servants. The people, the people praying were coming as Jesus' servants. They were serving him. They weren't asking him to serve them. We need to be a church that sees ourselves as the servants of Christ. First thing, God's purposes, not Andy's purposes. God's purposes, not your purposes. God's purposes, we serve him, amen? Second thing in the first verse of this, to continue. This means they were already doing it. Yes, they had already been filled. They had already been set up with the mission of God, but they were praying to be able to continue their mission. And what I want us to see here is that they were already in motion, a lot of us hold our hands out to Jesus and say, Lord, if you fill me, I might do something. Lord, if you just wow me with your power, because I'm so scared, if you wow me with your power, then I'll do something. No, these disciples in Acts chapter 4, they were already going. Lord, grant your servants to continue. They were already doing the work. And what work were they were doing? Continue to speak your word. We were speaking his word. Not a political agenda, not our ideas, not the gospel of anybody else, just the gospel of God. Let us continue to speak your word, to proclaim that is the very nature of the Great Commission, all that Jesus commanded, all of the gospel. Grant your servants to continue to speak your words with all boldness. Verse 30, while you stretch out your hand to heal and signs and wonders are put, sorry, I missed one. Hang on, rewind. To speak your word with all boldness. Do you see what the early church is praying? Let us continue we are your servants. Let us speak your word and let us be bold while we do it. Is that our prayer? When we pray first thing in the morning, is that our prayer? Lord, let us continue and let us be bold with all boldness. It wasn't a little boldness. It was every available inch of boldness available to them. While you stretch out your hand to heal and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant. Are we believing in healings? Are we believing in signs? Are we believing in the wondrous move of the Holy Spirit and expectant for it? I think the quietness reflects our belief. I will say, church, we need to believe. We need to pray for it. We need to pray more for healing. We need to receive, God is saying, God wants to open ears. God wants to release the gifts of the Holy Spirit in this place for this city. And then verse 31. 
mountains, sorry, missing. And are performed, signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. Everything that was powerful was bestowed. The glory was given back to Jesus. And then verse 31 says, and when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. They were immersed again. Hence I say, baptized again, filled again with the Holy Spirit. Pentecost wasn't good enough for them. (laughs) A couple of days later, they're praying to be filled again. Are we an again church? Or are we a one and done church? If you shower one and done, you start to stink. (laughs) If you're filled with the Spirit one and done, I'm not sure that we're going anywhere. But the amazing thing that I love about Acts 4 is you know what they didn't do? You know what they didn't do? They didn't say, Lord, fill us again like you filled us at Pentecost. Many of us pray that prayer. Many of us pray that prayer when we're, when we're, when we're um, thirsty, when we're dry. Lord, fill me again like you filled me before. But here's the thing about the time that you were filled before. I'd say that it was because that God was sending you somewhere, God was doing something with you. If I think about every moment where I have had one of these encounters, these amazing fillings of the Holy Spirit, it's because I've already been walking towards something. And I'm scared, I don't have it within me, I don't have enough. And I'm praying and I'm like, Lord, just show me where you go, what you want me to do. It's not been praying for the Spirit. It's not been praying to be filled, but it's been praying for the mission of God that I would be used as His kingdom. And then the Holy Spirit comes. Do you see the difference? Do you you see the difference of those two things? It's important for us, church, because if we say that we want to be a Spirit-filled church, I believe in, in, in the attitude of Acts chapter four, it's in an attitude of we are a missional church and Lord, we need your Spirit to go do that. Not we wanna be a spiritual church and we'll see what happens. Once I get mine, I'll see what I can do for you, Lord. No, we need to continue. We need to go. We need to grow already. And when they had prayed for the mission, they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and they continued to preach the word with boldness. God answered that prayer through the filling of the Holy Spirit. The filling of the Holy Spirit wasn't the prize. It wasn't the end goal. The proclamation of the gospel was the goal, the prize. It was everything, amen? So, sorry, just down a little bit, please, Ben. It says that when they had prayed, the place that they were gathered together was shaken and they were all filled. You know, they weren't in the driver's seat. When the, the place was shaken, they weren't in the driver's seat. And I believe that for us, and I'd just like to invite us to stand right now. And I'm not actually going to invite you to the front for prayer. I'm going to invite you to pray. Because what I really believe, and as me and Camilla were talking this week, we're on the same page as, you know, at this time, in this season for this church, church, we need to be together in prayer, praying for our city. God has put us here for a reason. God has put us here for a reason. This is God's plan for Nanaimo, his church. Yes, we're not the holy church, but we are gonna be a church who's praying for our city. So just like the apostles prayed at that time, I want us to lift our voices in prayer. If you came to church every week this year, you've heard about 2,300 minutes of preaching. Is your life changed? Somebody said yes. Man, a good preaching, sweet. You've heard about 2,000 minutes of worship, awesome. 
How many minutes have we spent in prayer as a church for our city? Believe God highlighting that we need to learn to pray. Man, if we turned everything off and we said, hey, we're just gonna pray quietly as individuals for 15 minutes, you'd go nuts. A lot of us would go nuts. 15 minutes would drive us crazy. But we're just gonna ask God for our city right now. And we're not gonna end the service with a song. We're gonna end the service with a prayer for our city because I believe God wants us to intercede and wants us to pray. Can we lift our voices for this place? Do you understand what we're doing here? If the Spirit comes, fantastic. But we are gonna keep praying in these venues, in these avenues, in our quiet places, in our closets, in our cars, all this. And as we begin to pray, as I believe that, that God sees us going on mission, sees us hungry, he will blow his wind over us again and says, this is a church I wanna fill because they are on mission for me. Okay? So Lord God, let's lift our voices in prayer. Lord God, we are asking for our city, Lord God. We are asking for our city to be transformed, Lord Jesus. Lord, it's not enough that we only know you. It's not enough that I know you, Lord Jesus. We want to see our streets changed, our cul-de-sacs changed, our workplace changes. Lord, church, lift your voices, come on. Let's pray, even just pray for yourself that your heart would increase in this area. Lord, just come, Jesus. Lord, we wanna see this place trained, everything that we've tried, Lord God, comes up empty when it's not in you, Lord. Come, Holy Spirit, we pray, fill us for your mission, Lord Jesus. Lord, help us be mature and go, looking to what we can do for you as your servants. Grant us with boldness to continue to proclaim, continue to proclaim. If you're struggling with prayer, just go read Acts, the end of Acts chapter 4, and pray that. Holy Spirit, come. Something you can do is start to name people. Name people in your life who you want to see accept Jesus. Name them before the Lord and intercede for them. Name your street before the Lord.